today we've got this multidisciplinary advanced cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma care. And we're so fortunate to have um, Dr. Ryan Waite and Dr. Misha Miller um, here today to um, uh, address this topic. Um, Dr. Wade is an assistant professor at the Division of uh, Medical Oncology, University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. His background is in the treatment of skin cancers such as melanoma and provides specialized care for those patients who have been diagnosed with skin cancer, past or present. Uh, Misha Miller is, uh, Dr. Miller is an assistant professor at University of Colorado with special, specialty in dermatology, dermatologic and Mohs surgery. So, can we have a warm welcome to our speakers? Hi, I'm Isha Miller, and I'm at the University of Colorado. I'm an assistant professor there. And as Dr. Brown was saying, I am one of the most surgeons at the University of Colorado, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about how we at the main campus of the University of Colorado approach advanced cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas in a multidisciplinary fashion. I have no relevant disclosures to make, so I have some objectives for you. I um, do have a little bit more of a surgical bend on how to treat these cancers. So, and as a, so I will also, as a dermatologist, hope that you can identify squamous cell carcinoma. You can identify some of the high risk features of squamous cell carcinoma. I'd like to discuss Mohs micrographic surgery with you so that we all understand what is trying to, what we're accomplishing in that um, treatment plan and to review case studies that highlight a multidisciplinary approach. Squamous cell carcinoma most of you know is the second most common malignancy of the skin. The number one malignancy of the skin is basal cell carcinoma. It occurs on chronically sun exposed skin. It is the number one type of uh, skin carcinoma on the mucosa or the hands, also on the lips and the genitalia. So I have some examples in this slide. of squamous cell carcinomas on the lip. Um, as you know, this is a high-risk site. Not only is it a high-risk site for metastasis and recurrence, but it's also a high-risk site for the reconstruction. Uh, I would like to point out that many of these skin cancers that are on the face, when we remove them, we have to remember to restore form and function. And it is especially difficult when you do have a cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma of the lip. We have another example of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. So this gentleman has your prototypical squamous cell carcinomas. You see that the area where we are looking is the face and the ear, and you have these erythematous indurated papules that are hyperkeratotic. And sometimes I might bleed a little bit. The patients might say that they're painful. That is a sign that this is an advanced carcinoma with some perineural invasion when they do say that they're painful and they're erosive as well, as you can see on the back of the ear. Cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma especially occurs in the immunocompromised patient and they are at increased risk. In fact, if a patient has had a renal transplant, their risk of cutaneous cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma is about 18 times, is increased 18 times. They also might arise in areas of chronic inflammation. These are called margarine ulcers. They have a high rate of metastasis as well. This is an example of a moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma on the arm of a patient who has had a lung transplant about 10 years ago. It is not unusual for us to see a scenario such as this one, where you have a background of sun damage, which you can appreciate at this time, all of the, those lentigo, those brown spots on the arm indicate chronic sun exposure. And then you might see this fungating, out of control squamous cell carcinoma 
and the immunocompromised patient is definitely very difficult for them to try and keep their squamous cell carcinomas or even their precancerous lesions at bay. Now, this is something that we do see pretty commonly. Squamous cell carcinoma in situ on the genitals and um, as Dr. Brown knows and many of you know, I uh, also have a dermatoses, um, bulvar dermatoses clinic and we'll see it uh, pre-cancers and squamous cell carcinoma in situ on, on the vulva, but we, in this case, it's on the penis of an uncircumcised male. And he is not immunocompromised, but many times we do see this in immunocompromised patients. These cancers can be associated with HPV. They're associated with a lack of circumcision and chronic inflammation, especially in females, you'll see them in, with a background of lichen sclerosis. So chronic inflammation in that way. Uh, these may progress to invasive squamous cell carcinoma. There's a special type of squamous cell carcinoma in situ that I wanted to bring to the group tonight so that you know to be aware of it. And this is called erythroplasia of carot. Now, erythroplasia of carot is a special type of squamous cell carcinoma in situ that occurs only in men and on the penis. You will see an erythematous kind of velvety, moist plaque. However, this is very aggressive, even though it's squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Approximately 30% of these patients will go on to develop invasive squamous cell carcinoma. And there's a 20% metastatic rate as well. So the question of whether this cancer is HPV related is a little bit up in the air. Some studies have found that it's related to HPV-8, and some studies have not. So aggressive management is really needed to treat erythroplasia parat. Usually you have a, uh, a multidisciplinary treatment group that consists of most surgery and urology. Urology. urology because many times there is urethral involvement. Squamous cell carcinoma does have some high risk features associated with it that might make you think to, that you must be a little bit more aggressive with certain types of squamous cell carcinoma. So in terms of the histology, if a squamous cell carcinoma has a Breslau depth greater than two millimeters or Clark level greater than or equal to four, that is considered um, a high risk squamous cell carcinoma. However, there is lack of uniformity in reporting of these measures, and so you really cannot count on them from your dermatopathologist necessarily. Other high-risk features include perineural invasion. If the diameter of the nerve is greater than 0.1 millimeter, that usually calls for you to think about adjuvant therapy, and also if there is lymphovascular invasion. Other high-risk features include a tumor diameter greater than 20 millimeters, the location of the cancer being on the temple or the ear or the lip. And the temple isn't a place that has been commonly and traditionally associated with a high-risk high squamous cell carcinoma, but recent studies do show that. If the differentiation of the squamous cell carcinoma is poor, that is a high-risk feature, and again, the margillins also, so it's a background of inflammation such as a burn, a previous burn, um, is, is much more associated with high risk features than a sunlight induced squamous cell carcinoma. Now I'd like to switch gears and talk to you about most micrographic surgery as a treatment modality. And this is what I do, so of course, um, I really love this treatment modality. So what is Mohs micrographic surgery? It is, it's a procedure, it, it is outpatient based, it offers high rate of skin cancer cure, and um, it's done by tr dermatologists traditionally that have done a fellowship in Mohs micrographic surgery. It is recommended as a first line treatment for the majority of high risk skin cancers because you have margin control, and we're gonna go over that in just a moment. 
So one might ask, is Mohs micrographic surgery better than traditional excision? Well, in a recent study um, out of the British Journal of Dermatology, uh, a, a group compared most micrographic surgery outcomes that with traditional excision, and the rate of recurrence was lower with most micrographic surgery, somewhere around 3% recurrence rate, as opposed to 8% with excision. So most micrographic surgery differs in its histologic examination uh, from traditional, say, your biopsy, your paraffin embedded biopsy that you send to your pathologist. Your paraffin embedded um, tissue will be cut in a bread loaf fashion. So just like you would cut a loaf of bread, vertical sections. In this way, then you're really seeing less than 1% of the histologic margin. So just remember that when you biopsy something and it comes back to you and it says that the tumor does not extend to the margin. Please note that you really aren't seeing very much of the margin and so it's very difficult to make that call in terms of what you do next. So most micrographic surgery because of the way that we section, and I'm gonna go over that in a minute, we see 100% of the surgical margin in each slice. So in this way, it really does give you excellent and superior margin control as, a, as opposed to traditional uh, excision, or even when you're looking at the report from your biopsy. Most micrographic surgery also allows for the sparing of normal tissue because in traditional excision, what you're doing is taking a standard of care surgical margin that you're cutting out around the tumor that you can see with your eye in order to help you get a negative margin. However, with Mohs micrographic surgery, what we're doing is taking a very thin two millimeter or so margin and examining that tissue micrographically at the time of surgery so that we can say whether the tumor is in or out, Take, so we're taking much less tissue. So I have some examples here of how the tissue in Mohs micrographic surgery is processed. So on the far left, you see that the tumor is removed uh, at a 45 degree angle. The piece of tissue then may be divided or it might stay whole depending on the characteristics of the tissue and how easy it is to make it uh, conform to sort of a flat pancake shape. The tissue is then actually flipped over um, and frozen onto what's called a chuck. The tissue is then processed on FOSS, which means that horizontal sections are taken. With taking the tissue at a 45 degree angle out of the patient, we can make the epidermis kind of flop over on, uh, to the side of the dermis, which means that then when we slice the tissue horizontally, you're seeing all of the epidermis and the dermis at the same time. Our slides look like the middle pane there. We usually have three to five pieces of tissue at, uh, per slide, and the most technician will travel approximately 1,000 microns into the tissue uh, when all is said and done. On the far right pane, you see an example. This person actually has basal cell carcinoma, and, but you see how you will you can appreciate the epidermis, which is this dark purple color, and then the dermis is all of this sort of lighter pink color throughout. The epidermis is not contiguous in this picture because we have hashed the tissue with our scalpel, but the epidermis is actually um, contiguous except for that portion where we have surgically separated it. So I just wanted to show you some examples of things that we that I have seen under the microscope. These are my slides from some patients. Um, this is actually a very recent patient who has moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So this patient was immunocompromised. Um, he's had a heart transplant, and you can see that there are there's a lot of nuclear atypia. That those are the dark the dark purple nuclei, some are enlarged, some are dark, some are light. You also see some mitotic figures throughout. 
Um, you do not see what keratinocytes usually do, which is to make keratin pearls. Um, that's one way that this is differentiated into uh, moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Next is another high-risk feature. You see intravascular cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. So in this particular patient, I did use the multidisciplinary approach of uh, adjuvant radiation after the tumor was cleared with Mohs micrographic surgery. This patient actually did not recur, and that's great. This is an example of perineural invasion, and my purpose tonight is not to turn you into dermatopathologists, but I just want you to appreciate that we can see these high-risk features under the microscope, sometimes a little bit more than your traditional dermatopathologist because we have many more sections to look at, as I demonstrated before. Um, so this is cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, and this is a nerve and the cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma is tracking along the nerve. So when we see this, we want to measure the nerve because we want to know, does it, a, does it qualify? Um, does it get into that 0.1 uh, millimeter or above range, or is it smaller than that? So most micrographic surgery is heavily regulated and actually we have regulated it ourselves as most surgeons because at some point we knew that the insurance companies would try to regulate it for us. So there's something called the appropriate use criteria and this is an app that you, if you're interested, you can have, get for your phone. And basically you plug in the characteristics of the cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma. They also have something for Merkel cell carcinoma and some of the other less usual tumors. And basically we'll give you a score. And the score will designate whether or not the tumor is appropriate for most micrographic surgery. This is what the app looks like. It's very simple to use. Um, and the green, yellow, and red indicate the appropriateness of the procedure using those micrographic surgery for that, for that tumor. So most micrographic surgery is very cost effective. Um, and several studies have looked at the cost of most micrographic surgery in comparison with a straight excision, and the costs are very similar. However, just remember you're getting so much more with most micrographic surgery, especially the uh, controlling the margins. Now Dr. Wade is going to review some of the advances in squamous cell carcinoma, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma treatment. Thank you, Misha. Appreciate it, and I appreciate your willingness to handle the surgical uh, discussion in this talk and for agreeing to be here. And I just want to thank um, Hira from the Association of uh, Community Cancer Centers for putting this together, Nicole and Dr. Brown from the RMOS Society for having us today. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about advanced treatment or, or systemic treatment for advanced squamous cell carcinoma. Um, uh, but just to repeat what Dr. Brown said, I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Medical Oncology at the University of Colorado. Here are my disclosures. So before we talk about the systemic treatment for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, I think it's important to talk about how we can prevent squamous cell carcinoma. And in terms of systemic therapy, there's really only one um, uh, paper that we need to discuss, and that's the New England Journal paper for uh, a randomized phase three trial of nicotinamide for skin cancer chemo prevention. And so this study actually looked at uh, 386 patients of a randomized and one-to-one -one fashion uh, with at least two non-melanoma skin cancers in the past five years. And they were randomized to 500 milligrams of nicotinamide BID versus placebo for the prevention of additional squamous cell carcinomas. Um, and if you don't, if you aren't aware uh, up front, nicotinamide is actually a vitamin B3, uh, which is a precursor to NAD, which is uh, necessary for ATP production. And so the thought around this is that if you have UV exposure and squamous cell carcinoma is secondary to 
um, uh, to UV changes in the skin, there's DNA damage that occurs in a loss of ATP, and this helps to replete the deficient ATP and therefore reduces the um, incidence of, of uh, early squamous cell carcinomas. So the results from this study you can see here on the bottom left um, showed a statistically significant reduction in non-melanoma skin cancers and as well as a statistically significant reduction in squamous cell carcinoma with the application of nicotinamide, and it leaned towards statistically significant or trended towards for basal cell carcinoma. Um, what's interesting about this study is that at six months or so after the treatment, that benefit was lost. So presumably patients would need to continue on this therapy to have the benefit. And then on the right side, we see that actinic keratoses were also decreased in this study for those who went on to therapy. So, uh, and Dr. Miller showed a little bit of the risk uh, and what the high-risk features are, how we identify high-risk cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. But there's a couple things that I wanted to point out in terms of um, what, where some of these studies came from that define this risk. And so on the left, we have a study that came out in 2008 that really um, helped to define the thickness of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, what's high-risk versus what is not. The high-risk features uh, being greater than two millimeters, you see a reduction in uh, the probability of uh, distant metastasis-free survival, and then you would see with, um, uh, with, with greater than six millimeter um, cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas, you see a further reduction. And in panel D, I just wanted to point out that it's interesting from the Brigham and Women's um, staging studies that those with primary, um, primary tumors from zero to four risk factors differentiated greatly between two and three risk factors uh, versus just one high risk feature. And so if you look at the overall survival for those with a T2B, where you start to see the drop off, you see that that overall survival is at around 40% at eight years, and I think that's important to keep in context when we talk about the survival for treatment of metastatic disease. So in terms of treatment for advanced cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, I'm gonna put the summary slide first, and then we'll dive into the details just a little bit. So the take home points are really that adjuvant chemotherapy and, and radiotherapy um, are useful historically with the plus or minus chemosensitizing cisplatin for high risk uh, squamous cell carcinoma, which would include extracapsular extension of nodal disease, positive margins uh, for a nodal excision, multiple involved nodal disease or stage three disease, and also T3 and four local disease with, ver with uh, very high risk uh, primary features um, as Dr. Miller reviewed. Um, however, that's really a historical perspective and we still use multimodality therapy uh, after surgery for, um, to decrease the risk of these uh, recurring in the future. However, currently we are moving more towards an anti-PD-1 model, which we're seeing move across oncology in general. Um, in terms of recurrent and metastatic systemic therapy, um, historically there's cohort series that have shown activity of a number of different cytotoxic chemotherapies that are listed here, and then more recently we've had the EGFR agonists such as cetuximab, panitumumab, et cetera. The limitation to these cytotoxic therapies and these anti-EGFR therapies are that the progression-free survival really uh, maxes out at around five months. And so you get a durable resp or a response that we will see, but it's very short-lived. So looking at the adjuvant space, I uh, just have one slide on the adjuvant space because really in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, a lot of the data that we use to treat these patients are, is extrapolated from the head and neck data. So that's mucosal squam. There's, there's plenty of randomized studies um, to direct care in that setting. But in the cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma realm, um, it's a very different disease type because most of these are uh, caused by a, a UV exposure um, and genetic changes related to that. Um, so in this space, there are almost no randomized prospective studies um, for, for, a lot of this, for a lot of ways that we treat these patients. So in the adjuvant space, really the only meaningful study um, that you can find is this retrospective chart review looking at 20 years of experience, 167 patients of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma in the head and neck. Important thing to point out here, this was they were looking uh, at patients who received surgery followed by adjuvant radiotherapy, uh, definitive radiotherapy versus surgery alone. 
the population was very mixed, but the most important thing to point out is that the surgical arm only had 21 patients, whereas the surgery plus radiation had 146. So very disproportionate in the numbers that we're looking at. But clearly you can see on the right that the surgery and the adjuvant radiotherapy arm did much better, at least retrospectively, than those who just had surgery alone. And this is really what we use today to define our treatment for high-risk adjuvant uh, radiotherapy. Um, there have been attempts at randomized trials. If you see at the bottom, there was an RTOG study that accrued almost 300 patients, and they were looking at the adjuvant high-risk cutaneous space. It was a randomized control, control trial excuse me, of radiotherapy uh, versus concurrent radiotherapy with carboplatin. Unfortunately, this turned out to be a negative trial, and it was discontinued early. So there's been some attempts, but really no randomized data in this space. When we talk about unresectable disease, now this can be stage three advanced, uh, locally advanced, or metastatic disease. Um, that's what we're referring to as unresectable. There is a, a retrospective study that was recently published in 2016 that looked at, it was a single institution, a mix of local, regional, and metastatic disease, and it encompassed all sorts of treatments, including cetuximab, capecitabine, et cetera. But it's interesting what the authors did here in, um, in, in uh, separating out those who received platinum at, in combination with any other therapy versus those who did not receive platinum, and that's what you see here on the right. And you can see a um, statistically significant benefit of those who received platinum with a progression-free survival of about 20%. And the curve on this survival actually flattens out. And I know it's retrospective, but um, there are patients who are cured with cytotoxic chemotherapy alone. When we talk about the EGFR inhibitors, the monoclonal antibodies, there was a seminal study in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2011, looked at cetuximab as a first-line therapy. Again, this is a phase two, non-randomized open-label study, so um, not a randomized controlled trial, but they were looking at cetuximab as first-line therapy for unresectable squamous cells. A small study, about 36 patients, they received standard dose cetuximab with a loading bolus, and the endpoint was actually six-week disease uh, control rate, which they reported as 70%, which is very good, but only at six weeks. As you can see in the progression-free survival curve in panel B, the progression-free survival drops off rapidly. The median here is about four months for the intention to treat population. But it's interesting to note that EGFR IHC immunohistochemical expression um, has been reported to be 80 to 100%. And so, I mean, these patients have 100% expression of EGFR in their tumor. It's just that the responses are very short-lived. So this is kind of a busy slide, but this summarizes all of the other data that is out there, which is very scarce in, in terms of cytotoxic chemotherapy. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but this um, top study by um, Tradello actually points out it was another retros retrospective mixed study with radiation and other combination therapies, but they looked at cetuximab versus cisplatin. Those who received cetuximab-based therapies versus those who received cisplatin, cisplatin. Sample size was very small with cetuximab, but they argue that those who received cetux did a little bit better than those who received cisplatin. The one thing I will point out here is that if you look at the other combinations, such as or things that have been tried, such as 5-FU, bleomycin, cisplatin, doxorubicin, et cetera, very, very small number of uh, prospective observational studies, but the CR here, in both in all of these studies across time seems to be fairly consistent with cisplatin and we saw that in the previous retrospective study so I think it's safe to say you get around a 25 maybe 20 to 30 percent complete response rate with uh, cisplatin based therapy so we probably should have warned you of all the grotesque pictures that we were going to show you during dinner beforehand but um, this is a patient of mine that I treated out in uh, Philadelphia it was a 53 year old male uh, with this cutaneous lesion that he allowed to grow um, unabated for about three years um, at the time this was before the approval of the immune checkpoint blockade drugs which we're about to talk about but it highlights the response the rapid response that you see with induction uh, chemotherapy so two cycles of cisplatin docetaxel and weekly cetuximab resulted in a near complete clinical response he went on to to receive a consolidation radiotherapy with weekly cetuximab, and um, the last that I heard from him is that he was disease-free. So this brings us to the more modern age of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, and by modern, we're talking 
um, what's the date on this? 2018, late 2018. So this is a New England Journal article um, that uh, uh, announced some Miplomab to the world, the PD-1 blockade for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. This was a study that had 85 patients. Again, this was a non-randomized uh, phase one, phase two study, phase one, phase two B, and they were different populations for phase one and phase two, but there's a couple of uh, features that I think is important to point out in terms of the patient population that they were studying is it's not the usual population that we see in randomized control studies. So these patients were older, older than 65, 73% of them in the phase two. They were mostly male, 92% male. Head and neck comprised 64%, so the majority. Um, they were heavily pretreated. So in the phase two arm that you see here in the right column, far right column, there was 20% of, of those patients had received greater than two regimens before going on to this drug. 56, over half, had received at least one. Um, and then 85% had received previous radiotherapy, which I think is important. Um, and then they included both distant metastases and regional metastases. So here's the, here's the data, the results for this study that led to the approval of semiplomab uh, as first-line therapy for metastatic and locally advanced cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, and that was in September of 2018. So the overall response rate that was reported in this study was only around 50%. This was a very heterogeneous population, again, small numbers, um, but keep in mind that 60% of them were previously treated, so a 50% benefit is quite remarkable. However, if you look at the waterfall plot on the top left, you see that uh, there's about a 70% clinical benefit. So those who have stable disease are still deriving clinical benefit, meaning that their tumor is stopping from growing the administration of this agent. And that means 70% of patients are responding to this drug, which is quite remarkable. We really haven't hit that benchmark even in melanoma and others for single agent PD-1 therapy. So maybe Merkel cell would be the only other one that I would include. And the most and the best part about this, as we see with most of the immune checkpoint blockade agents, is that the uh, response is durable with um, with with sustained responses ongoing for the majority of the patients who achieved a response, which is what is shown on the right. This is a picture of the patient that was actually published in the New England Journal. So you can see he was in the phase one arm, but he had these multiple nodular ulcerating cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas of the scalp that completely resolved within six weeks. So this drug works very quickly. We understand that these eight, we're beginning to understand in our melanoma studies and others that these agents actually have activity within the peripheral T cell subset, which they act upon uh, within seven days of administrating the drug. So you can see rapid responses. You don't always see it, but you certainly can. The progression-free survival curve is shown here at 50 or so percent, as was reported when the overall response rate. There's one more here. Oh yeah, and we're not supposed to compare across studies and certainly wouldn't compare this study to this older retrospective study, but I did just want to remind you that the progression-free survival for the cisplatin-based study that I showed you before is about 30%, 25%, and now we're looking much more in the range of 55%, so a significant improvement in clinical benefit. So here's another grotesque picture for you as you dive into uh, pasta. Um, so this is a, a courtesy of Dr. Lewis. This is a, he tells me this is the first patient that he treated with um, with a PD-1 antibody or immune checkpoint blockade for a locally advanced unresectable squamous cell carcinoma. So the patient started with this, and after just a couple of treatments, this was within six weeks or so. You see a dramatic change in the uh, in the phenotype of this tumor after just a few infusions of PD-1 therapy. A continued response with just uh, infusions alone. And then a complete response with, uh, with systemic therapy with, um, with an anti-PD-1 agent. So pretty, pretty remarkable. And um, I was told that he didn't require any additional radiotherapy or surgery following this systemic, this, this complete response. So this is uh, just single agent monotherapy response. So I point this out, this was a patient of mine um, that was previously treated, and this was a lady with very little, I'd say average sun exposure for the Jersey Shore, um, and, uh, but she comes in with no nodal or regional disease, scans were completely normal aside from what you see on her skin, 
very interesting patient. I've never seen another one of these, but she had multiple uh, more adva locally advanced basal cell carcinomas as well as uh, early squamous cell carcinoma. Some of them are probably invasive. We just didn't biopsy them all. You can see there's more than 50 lesions involving the leg, the trunk, and other areas we didn't photograph. And this was again before the approval of the PD-1 agents, but we elected to put her onto um, nivolumab. And she had within 10 weeks or so, she had a, a, you can start, and I don't have the resolution pictures, unfortunately, but she ended up having a complete response in all of her lesions to PD-1 therapy as time went on. But you can see on the panels on the right that the skin was starting to regenerate and these lesions were starting to heal with PD-1 therapy alone. The only reason that I show this is that these agents not only work for cutaneous, but can also work for mixed uh, skin subtypes, and also not only locally advanced, but sometimes you see patients that just have multiple lesions. Where if you were to uh, send them to Dr. Miller and say, "Please resect all of these," she would she would say that would be all of her skin. So we can't quite do that. Um, and same with radiation would be extraordinarily toxic. So there are various populations that can benefit from these agents and systemic therapy. So I just wanted to point out a couple of selected trials. Where is the field going in terms of systemic therapy for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma? If you don't see your favorite trial, it's because I did self-select these, what I thought were the most interesting, but there's really not many more than this if you, if you were to look. Um, there's really a paucity of trials in this space. But I will start from the top. So there's an albilumab, which is an anti pd one antibody with the combination of cetuximab. Uh, for squamous cell carcinoma. The second trial is very interesting, or at least I think it would be really interesting, because a lot of these patients have undergone transplantation and they're immunosuppressed. So uh, this is a trial that's actually looking at kidney transplant recipients and giving them tacrolimus, nivolumab, and ipilimumab. Uh, I think that's a very interesting concept in a space that we certainly need some more data uh, within. The unscarred study is avelumab again with radical radiotherapy. So combining PD-1 with radiotherapy, we then go on to TBEC, and nivolumab, so you can of course inject these lesions with oncolytic uh, viruses directly. And then there's the um, anti j 3 that's a melanoma-associated antigen. Uh, that's an adenovirus and also an oncolytic uh, a compound that secretes j 3 in combination with pembrolizumab uh, for um, high-risk cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. That's a very interesting concept. Uh, there's preoperative semiplumab uh, administered intravenously, or I'm sorry, intralesionally directly into the tumor. That's a, the, the point to take away from that is that the PDL1 antibodies, remember, they act with the PDL1 ligand at the site of the tumor. So in theory, you can inject these drugs directly into the tumor and they can act locally. You don't necessarily have to give it systemically. That wouldn't really work for your anti-CTLA4 antibodies, which act at the site of the node, not at the site of the tumor interaction with the T cell. Um, there's an adjuvant semiplumab study uh, with uh, after surgery and radiation. And then I also put in a, a um, semiplumab in combination with a modified herpes virus similar to TVEC. <coughs> And so if you're interested in, if you have some patients and you're interested in putting them on trial a little closer to home, these trials are currently enrolling uh, at the university at Anschutz. So this, neither of these were mentioned in the previous slide, but we have pembrolizumab versus placebo following surgery and radiation uh, in participants with locally advanced cutaneous well, uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So that's Keynote 630, that's actively enrolling. These are really high-risk patients with high-risk nodal disease who go on to receive radiation and then they randomize to pembro or placebo. Uh, we also have a Regeneron study uh, looking at a LAG3 monoclonal antibody, which is a different type of checkpoint blockade, um, in combination with semiplumab, the anti pd one monoclonal antibody, in advanced malignancy, so it's a phase one study, but it's enrolling a cutaneous squamous cell arm. And then I think we have a few multidisciplinary cases. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd like to highlight our multidisciplinary work at the University of Colorado. We have a tumor board where we have a lot of different specialties uh, represented, included, including myself and, and Dr. Mariah Brown in dermatologic surgery. We have dermatopathology, cutaneous oncology, um, radiation oncology, ENT, surgical oncology, and uh, radiology. And we all meet together once a week to discuss these tough cases. 
And these three cases that I'm gonna to present to you have all had multidisciplinary care, and I'll, I'm going to highlight that in the cases. So, case number one is a 77-year-old male. He's a referral from the VA. So, of course, you already know this is probably going to be a neglected tumor. Um, he has a biopsy-proven, well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma at the left temple, high-risk site, and um, he had a CT scan which showed a question of blurring of the plane between the tumor and the frontal bone, and there was a question of invasion. So this is when he presented. So, of course, all the pictures that we're gonna show you are going to be extreme examples. And this is an extreme example of a cutaneous horn that has grown from a squamous cell carcinoma. This, um, is, of course, is a neglected tumor, and this is a really sad case because the patient didn't trust anyone to help him. But this is how he presented, um, and I'm not quite sure how he was able to live with such a large cutaneous horn, but he was. And also, this is a lesson in patient history because his history was that I've only had this for four months. And of course, that's not true. So this is um, the, so this patient came to me and I performed Mo's micrographic surgery. Now, because there was a question of bony invasion, I worked with ENT, so in conjunction with ENT, and we do this quite often, what I'll do is make sure to clear the periphery of the tumor. So when you see this border here, the, the outside ring, every all the skin beyond that area, all that periphery is free of tumor. In this way, ENT knows that they have like a target, basically. They need to clear this portion down to the deep, including the bone. So the patient went to ENT, they cleared the deep central portion of the defect, and then they burred the bone. And this is a very common thing that ENT does for treatment of squamous cell carcinomas, and sometimes basal cell carcinomas that look like they've invaded the periosteum and thus might have invaded the bone as well. And we do have that scan saying that um, there's a question of the bony invasion. This patient then went to radiation oncology for adjuvant radiation for external beam radiation therapy. However, after completing one session, he was lost to follow up and did not receive any more radiation. So case two is a 43-year-old male who has biopsy-proven cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma with clear cell features. It's located on his left zygomatic cheek. He was sent to Mohs. I cleared the tumor in two stages and repaired the, the defect with a complex layered closure. Now you might ask, why did I include that I was able to repair this defect with a complex layered closure? A complex layered closure is just a, a pretty simple closure where you're able to bring the skin side to side. And the reason why I put that in there is so that you would all know that really this was not a big surgical defect. The tumor was not um, very widespread. So this is the gentleman right here. This is his squamous cell carcinoma. Pain on the left, your left. This was his defect. Not too big at all. Nothing that you would say is, is um, enormous or out of the normal realm. And then this was his repair. So I thought everything was fine. However, just only four months later, he represented, and I hope that you all can appreciate this, with this swelling on his left side. So he has a parotid mass right there. So the FNA team was called in clinic and came up to see him and performed an FNA, a fine needle aspiration, and it was positive for malignant cells consistent with squamous cell carcinoma. 
So he has metastasis to the parotid gland. So a CT scan was performed and the patient was positive for having a pulmonary nodule in addition to this parotid gland nodule. Uh, Simiflumab was started and the patient completed four cycles. The patient then, after four cycles, had a parotid resection as well as a head and neck lymph node dissection by ENT. So this was multidisciplinary in that once he was known to have a recurrence, cutaneous oncology was involved, simiplumab was started, then ENT got involved. After the four cycles, a parotid resection was done. And this, this is very recent. In fact, his resection was done like four days ago. The pathology just came back and there was no viable tumor in the parotid gland. And 29 lymph nodes were sampled and all of them were negative. So um, his medical therapy really worked. So now the question is, does, should we do adjuvant radiation or not? And this patient is actually managed by uh, Teresa Medina, who's one of our cutaneous oncologists, and I need to talk with her and see what our next step is. He is getting a repeat CT for that pulmonary nodule to see if it also has responded or whether or not it's stable. Case number three, and this is our last case, involves a 76-year-old male, and this is not an unusual presentation for us, and you'll see the pictures in just a moment. He has a history of numerous basal cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas. So, as Dr. Waite was, was saying, many of these patients can't really be put into one box of saying, well, you only have squamous cell carcinomas. Sometimes we have to find agents that may treat both squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. This patient had a history of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. He, um, he came into the clinic saying it was on my right face, so that's not very specific at all, but that's how he presented and what he said. He said he had a lymph node dissection and also radiation. He was not immunocompromised, but received a lot of UV radiation from his summers growing up at the Jersey Shore. So this is um, this patient, and he is, you can see that he has a mixture of basal cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas. And honestly, he's just covered with, with these skin cancers. Um, there, there were times when I, was doing Mohs on him and, and thought, well, how am I gonna repair this? I cannot recruit skin using a local flap because I would just be moving diseased skin into a surgical defect. So this patient um, had multiple Mohs micrographic surgeries to treat both his basal cell carcinomas and his squamous cell carcinomas. So after about seven most procedures and three excisions in one year, he, uh, I decided that I needed to get the cutaneous oncology group involved and that he might be treated in a different way. So he was presented our, at our multidisciplinary tumor board and I just had, I've listed the specialties in, that are involved in the multidisciplinary tumor board and so that you can see them again, but I did, I, have already verbally listed them. The decision was made to start him on Primbro, Primbro, excuse me, and he did have good responses in terms of the cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas. It did help to lessen his basal cell carcinomas as well. However, he did not have as much of a, a, a complete response. Admittedly, he looks not great, uh, but what I do want to point out, if you'll go back to the other pictures where his skin was just covered with, with skin cancers in the picture after being treated with pembrolizumab, 
his skin is pretty clear. He does have a lot of scars and a lot, and he has an ectropion up here of his right eye. Um, he definitely has had a lot of surgeries on his face. But his background of skin cancers really have decreased. So uh, he was offered this Motigib to help with his basal cell carcinomas and he refused. And then he was um, offered other surgical treatment and he has refused that as well. So in, in looking back at the um, case that we presented earlier with the multiple BCCs and SCCs, I, we, we noted the exact same thing, which is that the basal cell carcinomas, and that's not what this talk is about, seems to respond to both a slower rate and a lower rate than those of the cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas. However, they do respond. We just don't know what percentage of those do to anti-PD-1 systemic therapy. So when you have a patient with multiple cutaneous malignancies of different subtypes, um, you, you can certainly consider treating with the systemic therapy, but just know that the basal cell carcinomas might require additional adjuvant consolidation uh, therapy, bismotigib, something else. Um, in fact, the one patient that I did show, the larger lesions uh, were, were kind of spot radiated uh, for the basal cells um, in order to, to get her to complete resolution. So I have a slide of, of, the, um, of my references and acknowledgements and it comes later. But I just, I, oh, thank you very much. So I do want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Teresa Medina and Dr. Carl Lewis um, and, the, and the cutaneous oncology group uh, the Kate, for helping to co-manage the patients that I have shown you in, in my cases. And also Dr. Julie Goddard and Dr. Adam Torella and ENT for also helping to co-manage those patients. And now we are going to discuss the importance of multidisciplinary care um, as really uh, identified in the site visits um, that have been put forth by the Association of Community of, uh, Cancer Centers. So the first is George Washington and there is literature available for you to read so that you can get more information about these uh, centers of excellence, but George Washington Cancer Center, um, are, they are concentrating on uh, a newly developed cutaneous oncology program and that consists of multidisciplinary teams led by dermatologic surgeons. They're focusing on personalized care for the patient um, so that not every patient is treated in, the similar man in a similar manner, and they are very heavily involved in clinical trials. At Oregon Health uh, Services University and the Knight Cancer Institute, they see a large volume of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma patients. They have a program that's modeled after a well-established melanoma program, and um, they are able to have a virtual tumor board meeting and um, very very vibrant program there, so that every so that multiple Specialties can render an opinion on uh, patient presentations. At the University of Missouri, at the Ellis Fischel Cancer Center, um, they uh, work in conjunction with MD Anderson. Uh, they specialize and focus on emerging, emerging multidisciplinary care as, as well. They have a, a very vibrant teledermatology program. Um, that works with the, off of the ECHO platform so that they can reach those patients that do not have a lot of access to care and they also have many ongoing clinical trials. Okay. Thank you and we'll take some questions. <clears throat> Curious, how are you guys using, uh, utilizing sentinel biopsies for uh, Um, it's it's highly variable, um, but I do believe that for most, um, well, I don't want to say for most, uh, but if there's high-risk features in the primary cutaneous 
lesion, especially for T3, T4, without any palpable disease. Most of the time, these patients are being imaged, cross-sectional imaging, if they have higher risk features in their primary that we know about beforehand. Um, and in, in that particular setting, if the imaging is negative, then we uh, consider a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Uh, but the, um, the, the guidelines for, well, there aren't, aren't really any guidelines, but the um, uh, expert consensus, I suppose you could say, for who you should be think, considering for a sentinel lymph node biopsy would be similar to that for the high-risk features of who should receive, um, um, at, considered for adjuvant radiation. So I'm curious, like for the first two cases, it didn't work. So to be honest, like Dr. White was saying, the sinolithno biopsies for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma are not very well defined. And so in terms of the surgical oncologist taking patients to the OR to perform a sinolithno biopsy for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, it's truly not done very often at the University of Colorado. Um, you know, if there are multiple high-risk features, and the size of the tumor seems to be what dictates it more, um, they may take the patient for a sinal lymph node biopsy, but at the University of Colorado, it's used mostly in the study of melanoma. And then um, another question, just to start, uh, how are you guys managing Yeah, it's a really good question, and I, it often depends on the site of disease and which tumor board they're being presented at, to be honest. So if it's a head and neck uh, patient, I will tell you that uh, what I have seen is that they'll be more likely to be considered for chemo radiation in a more traditional mucosal squamous cell treatment paradigm. Um, but I, but we, we would consider any one of those patients, and I would strongly urge this audience to consider anti-PD-1 therapy for somebody like that. Uh, you could either consider monotherapy up front and potential surgical or radiation consolidation. We also consider um, the benefit of radiation and PD-1 therapy. We know that it's safe to give radiation with PD-1 and pd one agents combined. There's plenty of uh, data to show that. Um, there, there have been some more recent concerns that were raised that have been raised with definitive courses of radiotherapy and depleting the um, in, in combination with PD-1 for cutaneous squamous cell and depleting the lymphocyte counts. Um, but that's very, very early, and a lot more studies are are, are needed. I, I think in general it's considered safe and a reasonable approach. Thanks. And one other, one other question on that: Are you guys uniformly using cimetolab, or will you use other PD-1 agents? Well, since simiplumab is the only one approved for this indication, um, we use predominantly simiplumab, but um, a couple of the patients that were presented here were treated with other PD anti-PD-1 agents, nivolumab and uh, pembrolizumab. Thanks. So, when do you send your patients with head and neck or for So really for parotid evaluation, we're looking more at the location of the, of the tumor. So temple or over the um, maxilla. Um, those patients are going for parotid evaluation. But the first step, honestly, is just for us to get traditional imaging, um, CT scan with contrast, and see if there's anything that needs to, that tells us that we should be suspicious of of a parotid invasion. 
The other thing I'll tell you that is, is very nice about most micrographic surgery is that I have seen many times tumor tracking into the parotid capsule and then beyond. And if I see that, then of course I'm going to ask the ENT surgeons to become involved and, and do a partial parotidectomy or, or, or total. No, if, if parotid invasion is um, suspected prior to Mohs, I would not do the Mohs. Perineural invasion, which is kind of what I was trying to demonstrate on my slides, is not always picked up on the biopsy. Many times it's picked up during Mohs, and so we don't, we're not aware of the per perineural invasion prior to surgery. So I personally don't order PET scans because um, they, I've been told that the patient is really only eligible for so many PET scans in a lifetime and I do not want it to be just a maybe let's just see kind of thing. Um, so I, I don't order PET scans. I usually leave that to the cutaneous oncologist and make sure that there is a very, very good indication for it before ordering a PET scan. And I think a CT scan would contrast perfectly reasonable. These are slow growing lesions over years and years, so they're usually mildly pet added at, at best. You can pick up most anything, in my opinion, with a, with a CT scan. Great, thank you very much. I would just wanna say thank you for having me here today and Yes, thank you everybody who already said a thank yous, but thank you for coming out as well, because it's a really great turnout, and it's my first RMOS meeting, so I'm very excited to be invited and to first be here. Many. First of many, there you go. So thank you everybody. This conference will now be recorded.